Hello, welcome to Saturn Fury Book Reviews. As usual, I'm Tina. Today I'm doing a book review of The Fenris Device by Brian M. Stableford. This is a classic sci-fi from Daw from 1974. This book is actually a first printing, which is kind of cool. Look at that cover, isn't it so cool? I love it. So I bought this book from a used bookstore. As usual, I started reading this before realizing it was part of a series. What is with these books from back then? They never tell you it's in a series. I do own the first two, actually. <laughs> there they are. But I don't own books three and four. Um, anyway, I got what was going on in the story, so it wasn't a big deal, but just wanted to point that out. Anyway, I have slightly modified my classic sci-fi bingo, which I will talk about later. I have also gone, I'm also going to try something different, which is I'm going to attempt to do, after the spoiler-free review, a synopsis for you of the entire story, because I don't know how many of you are actually going back and reading these books, but it will give the bingo more context. So. To start with, The Fenris Device is a quick, easy to follow, entertaining read that was actually quite a delight. <laughs> what is it about? Star Pilot Granger 5. Oh, there's what it says it. I guess I could have looked at the bag. <laughs> the oldest spacefaring race in the galaxy were the secretive Galiseans. Um, the most difficult type of planet to explore is a heavy gas giant, the Jovian Saturnian type planet, which with, with which all star systems abound. Somewhere on the storm reading the unapproachable surface of such a monstrous gas giant in abandoned Galassian warship was lying. It was reputed to be armed with a device known to legend as a Fenris weapon. Such stories attract adventurers thirsting for power. Such tales also attract the masters of the hooded swan who sought knowledge rather than power. And when they gave orders, Granger of the Double Mind had no choice but to obey. It was up to Granger, therefore, to take a little walk where no man had ever gone before, in a hell of nature's making and man's ambitions. That fact doesn't make any sense. Uh, so, I enjoy this book quite a bit, but in truth, there isn't very much to it. <laughs> we have Ranger, whom we learn has an alien inside his mind named Wind, whom he can talk to Venom style. Uh, he's also a space pilot, and he's of an indeterminable age, though from a few things he says, it seems he's rather a grizzled kind of older man than a young dude. He just wants to get out of his space contract. He's a pretty likable character because he's honorable, a bit grumpy, but not a wet blanket, and it's easy to root for him. <laughs> The other characters were quite flat, but it's possible this is because they are from the other books. The main villain in the story has an interesting um, rationale <laughs> for what he does. Uh, we get minimal background, though, on him and on the other characters. That's eh, not a big deal. The story itself is quite short and simple. The, the back makes you think it's some sort of race exploration thing, but instead it involves a hostage situation, an interesting ship, and some aliens. Also, a person who's out for vengeance. The tension isn't really there, and I could have used a lot more exploration of a certain ship, but it kept me engaged nonetheless. Where the story excels is in the writing. For a 1970s book, it's quick-paced, lacking in verbose carryover from the pre-modernist period, and the descriptions are absolutely lovely and immersive. I understand why Stableford is kind of a staple at used bookstores. Like, he's got a ton of stuff. I have a bunch of his too, but this might actually be the first one of his I've actually read. <laughs> Overall, if you want a quick little story with a decent plot, a likable main character, and great writing, check this one out. Or maybe check out um, book one instead, which is this one, Halcyon Drift. The covers are so cool. Okay, so here's the first new thing. As I said, I'm going to try to give you a synopsis of the story. Obviously, spoiler alert, this is the entire story. Um, it's, I'm trying to be as succinct as I can, so I might be leaving some stuff out. Uh, but I'm, I promise I won't be leaving out anything worthwhile. <laughs> so, as I said, Granger is a space pilot who is flying a special ship for his shifty boss. His boss wants to get to the surface of this planet Lucifer 5 because this would allow him access to an abandoned alien spacecraft, which he could use to barter strike up a rapport with these aliens called the Galasians, Galatians, whatever they're called. Galatians? Uh, oh, this is the wrong book. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. Anyway, the aliens. Um, the aliens refuse to learn English above a certain caste in their society, and they won't teach anyone their language. This is a big part of the plot. So there's this one guy, Ekimon, who is a go-between for Granger's boss, Shala, and Salvester, a Glacian, whom I believed hired Shala to get to the planet. Anyway, Granger has Eve, his doctor, to administer Sims to him as he tries to get to the planet. He's somehow connected to the ship. This part wasn't really explained, but he, like, can feel the damage the ship is taking. I think it allows him to, like, fly it more precisely. I 
it's not really explained. It's probably explained in the first book. Uh, and then there's also his engineer, Johnny, and Nick, his captain in the ship. They don't make it to the surface and they have to turn back. A few days later, they get a distress call. They go to a space yacht to find that a little person, Maslax, has taken it over and has a bomb on board. He kidnaps Granger's ship, the Hooded Swan, and the crew and forces them to take him to Loser for Five because he believes the ship that is trapped on the, you know, the surface of the world has the special weapon, the Fenris device that can destroy a world. He wants this because he wants to get revenge on people on a specific world who treated him badly for being a little person. It's quite sad, the stuff that he explains that happens to him. People just treating him like, like shit, essentially, being ignorant and stuff like that. Anyway, eventually they do get down to the planet, of course, and they get to the ship using this land buggy of some sort. They leave Johnny and Nick in the little hooded swan. They somehow get the ship to take off, but apparently it has a preset destination. At some point, Granger manages to get the upper hand on Maslax and takes over. I can't remember this kind of part. <laughs> a Galatian ship comes to help, but it won't talk to them because they're humans. Except in the greatest deus ex machina I've ever come across, the demon thing in Granger's head apparently can speak Galatian. Pfft. Okay, so basically it works as a go-between between the two ships, explains what happens, helps them get out of it. They send the ship blasting off to wherever it's supposed to go. And then Granger is free to find someone to drop him onto the planet so he can rescue the Hooded Swan. The entire idea or plot or purpose of the book is that the Gal Galaseans, or however you say their name, had hid the ship there on this planet because the ship was a remnant of a time when they were a warlike species, which they aren't now, and they wanted to retrieve it using secret means because they were worried about humans and wanted a way to defend themselves from humanity. Yeah. I mean, can you blame them? So... I'm going to move on to my classic sci-fi bingo. <laughs> you will see that I've replaced a couple things, moved some things around. I might mention them when I get to them. I might forget. So, outdated science. No, there's nothing. <laughs> Spaceship blows up. Yes, the Fenris device at one point does blow up a ship. It was a minor point in the story. I didn't feel like mentioning it. Social changes. Not really. Eve doesn't do much, and it's not really clear there are women space pilots. Likewise, the main gist of the plot deals with Maslax wanting revenge on people for treating him like a leper because he's a little person, which would suggest people are still assholes about disabilities in the future. I would hope this wouldn't be the case, but apparently not, so we don't have any social changes that way. <laughs> Sexy female scientist, Eve, being the only woman in the entire book, is not a scientist. She's a doctor, though, but she's also not sexualized, so she is not a sexy female scientist. Cool aliens, the Galatians are pretty cool. I'll read to you about them. <clears throat> the average Gullisan, however you say their name, I'm sorry, I have no idea, is about seven feet tall, but he looks taller because he has big ears which stick upward from his head. At least rumor has it they are ears. After several hundred years, we still don't know for sure. He has a face which might be yellow or brown, sometimes striped or blotched, the texture of wax. He has eyes in the back of his head as well as the front, but also has a mouth in the back of his head, but somewhat modified so that it doesn't look very much like the front. One, in is, one is for eating, the front one, and the other is for talking. A Galistain usually turns his back to you to talk to you, but if you are another Galistain, you have your back turned as well, so it doesn't seem rude. Because Galistains don't look at one another when they talk, they have no need of facial expressions, but they sometimes use gestures to attract the attention of the hind eyes, which habitually look at the sky or the ground. People have hypothesized that the Galistains have so many eyes and use them thus because on their home world they were prey to a large number of natural enemies. This remains conjecture. The Galistain body looks humanoid but is capable of movements which the humanoid is not. The Galistain's limbs are of varying size and multi-jointed and his body can coil like a spring over a full length. It is presumed that the Galistains are, remarkably, are remarkable athletes. The females of the species are similar in all respects save that they tend to be somewhat plumper than the males and do not make use of the coiling facility if they have it. Uh, yeah, so that was long. <laughs> There's also the alien parasite called wind. <laughs> Ancient tech and ruins. So I kind of modify that slightly. Yes, the ship, the Varsovian, is an ancient technology. It is not really a ruin, but it is ancient tech. That used to be foreigner technology. It used to be, like, the next row down, but I moved it up. Uh, generation ship. Yes, the Varsovian, as well as housing the weapon, is also a generation ship, which was something I didn't mention in, in the synopsis. Was basically, it was it had the Fenris device weapon, but also was intended to, like, take Galaseans and, like, send them away from other Galaseans when they were involved in the Civil War. It was like a, it was like a last-ditch effort to, like, preserve the culture. <laughs> uh, space soldiers. Nope. AI and robots. Nope. New Worlds, yes, Lucifer 5 is super cool. I'm going to read you about Lucifer 5 as well. Mm. 
The sky seemed to be about 20 feet above our heads, a boiling curtain of vapors that writhed from blue to gray to red. All the colors were dark. Though it was daylight here, there was less light to see by than the stars provided at night on Anomi, and they gave the impression of being spectral patterns in an oil slick. I'd never seen a sky that gave the impression of being so heavy. It was not merely oppressive, it was positively claustrophobic. It was as though the ground was one surface and the clouds another, with the merest crack between them, and it was all too easy to conjure up illusion that the crack was slowly closing, the sky slowly falling. I felt like a grain of wheat trapped between slowly turning mill, mill wheels. Um, actually, that's more about the sky than the planet, but <laughs> I thought it was a really cool description. Uh, cyberpunk. Nope, there's no cyberpunk. Blatant sexism. Nope. Eve is not um, seen to be any less worthy than anyone else for being a woman. She makes suggestions, is not talked over or shot down, drives the buggy, and is a woman in, ten in STEM, technically. They do not call the ships... They do call the ships she all the time, but that was par for the course back then, so that's fine. <laughs> Reptile aliens. So I think the Galaseans count because, you know, snakes are reptiles, right? <laughs> and these guys are pretty snake-like. I would say they're snake aliens if they're anything at all. LGBTQ plus to post-apocalyptic are all non-existent in this book. Uh, wild weaponry, I kind of modified that one from before. Yes, the Fenish device is pretty cool. It basically just blows things up. <laughs> Racial equality, um, no, simply because we don't know anyone's race. I'm assuming they're all white because no one's specified. It tends, it tends to be in these books, it's specified if a person isn't white. So, yeah. Uh, mind possession, yes, Wind is possessing Granger's mind and can take control of it if Granger lets him. So, definitely mind possession. This is something that happens more and more often as I've been reading through these books, I've noticed. So, that's why I added it to the bingo. Galactic war and tech from today, there is none of that. Uh, the Beckle test, this is hard to do when there's only one woman, so no. <laughs> quick, quick bonus, alien human romance, you'll see I moved that down. Uh, no, there's none of that, there's no female main character, and a derelict ship? Yes, there is a derelict ship, so good, good for that. Do we get a bingo? No. But that's okay. Uh, yeah, so as I said, I really enjoyed this one. I thought it was a lot of fun. I'm going to be adding it to like my favorite shelf, I think, probably. I also just love the cover. I love this it's the first printing, too. I, it must have been a different... I don't know if this is the same. No, this is pan sci-fi and this is DAW. So interesting. I wonder why they sold the rights to it. It makes me really want to read the first one. Anyway. <laughs> Thank you for watching.